disciples. Jesus called to help him. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, his son, Robert. All right, good morning. Wasn't that an awesome start? I tell them they can do that any week. They're ready to go uh, because it's a great way to get us going. All right, welcome. I'm Pastor David. I see uh, people out there I may not know, and if I don't know you, welcome this morning. Good to see you. Uh, if you want to turn yourself in, there's blue cards on the back table. You can fill those out and put them in the offering plate. We'd appreciate them. Um, we've got the opportunity now to uh, lift up our prayers. I'll, I'll wait till the kids uh, make their exit there. I don't want to miss anybody, any names. Um, hey, hey, Dale, where'd he go? Dale, is Jacob watching? Is Jacob watching now? Yes. All right, this is uh, Whiteout Day. We call it Whiteout Day. It's the day we wear our shirts to support Jacob and his trip. He'll be going again this week for his next treatment. He is watching, Dale says, right? Yes. All right, so on three, we want to say, uh, Jacob, we love you. How about that? So let's, let's be loud for him. One, two, three. Jacob, we love you. We love you, and we're praying for you, brother. We're going to do that right now. Uh, continue to remember Jacob. He is uh, in, increasing in strength. They're seeing things happen that, that are making the caregivers actually start to believe. Right, Dale? They're actually starting to believe. And we're getting more therapy, doing more physical acts. And, again, we're praying that he walks through that door. Uh, that's what we're praying for. We're praying for that miracle thing to happen. So we're praying for Dale and Barb as well as they travel with him this week to Columbus. Uh, pray for that next treatment to, to just continue to see that progress. Uh, pray for Bill Smith. Bill is in the last days uh, of his cancer. Uh, as we're going to talk today, he, he's going to win his battle. and so But it's going to be soon. He's, he's not coming downstairs much. He's not eating. Uh, so uh, again, uh, pray for Bill Smith. Pray for his wife, Billy, uh, Charles, and Carrie, as uh, they're fortunate to be around him in these days. Uh, pray for Terry. It's good to see Terry Wells with us this morning. Pray for him. Continue. And Bonnie also. Uh, pray for the Parkinson's treatments as well as his cancer treatments. Pray for Peggy Snyder. This is Alan's mom. Uh, she broke her hip. The surgery went well. She's going to have some PT coming up, so we'll remember Peggy. Uh, Joan Lilly asked us to remember a friend of hers named Susan with breast cancer, uh, and she's in hospice care. Uh, pray for the Morton family. Pray for Kermit. Uh, Kermit's sister passed away. We're grateful that Kermit and Faye were able to go down and spend some time with her in her late, later days. Uh, so pray for Kermit, please. Uh, Tony Hutton's son, we pray, pray for him. Destiny Reese's dad suffered another stroke. He's home recovering. And how about your unspoken needs? I know you have those. Hey, All right. Sorry. Yeah, Kenny. I was just told that my two sons were praying for me. Amen. Super. So many things we take advantage of, don't we? Amen. Well, thank you, Kenny. Thank you. All right. In the ministry we're going to pray for, we always pray for some local or, or uh, uh, missionary ministry. We're praying for the Andy Armstrong uh, prayer thing that's on the back table. Specifically, this is neat. I'm praying for Faith Garland Ministries on the streets of Boston. Listen to what they're doing. They're leading groups of volunteers to help women who, who need help, especially human trafficking. They're focusing on that. 
And so they're asking for prayer to build witnessing opportunities uh, with those who are seeking to help and for more churches to learn about and join in the fight against human trafficking. Uh, And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to join in. uh, It's a big issue that doesn't get enough airtime. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for the believers that, that are in this room this morning. There is so much strength in these numbers. Thank you for the kids and the blessing that they are and their families for bringing them here and trusting us with them. And so, God, you've, you've really done so much for us, and we're so grateful for it. Uh, now we're going to be uh, thankful for the answers to prayers that you're going to bring about. You have answered prayers in Jacob's life, and we continue that you, we ask that you, you touch him completely and bring him through those doors on his feet. Uh, we pray for safety as he goes to this next treatment. Pray for Dale and Barb as they walk the path with him. Uh, again, we just lift up their family. We thank you for the light that they are in, in, in Columbus and in, in our community, everywhere they go. Uh, everybody knows that they have faith in Jesus Christ, and they believe that God is, is almighty. And so, Father, thank you for their testimony and their witnesses. We pray for Bill. Uh, Father, he has battled cancer for so long. He has fought the, the good fight, and uh, he, he is about to receive his reward we thank you for the, the knowledge that he is saved. I thank you for that day uh, that Brother Ted led him to the Lord. Uh, Father, I pray for Bill, and I pray for Billy, and I pray for Ch- uh, Charles and Carrie as they, uh, they get to spend these last days with their father. pray for Terry. It's great to see him here. Thank you for giving him the, the strength and endurance to be here. I pray that you continue to bless his body uh, physically and, and keep him strong. Uh, God, thanks for Bonnie by his side. pray for her as well. We pray for Peggy, uh, God, for, for Alan's mom. Uh, thank you for the successful surgery. We pray for her upcoming therapy. We pray for Susan uh, battling with breast cancer. We, we pray for uh, Kermit uh, just uh, dealing with the passing of his sister. Uh, we pray for uh, Tony Huttenstein, Father, for the second, uh, second stroke. We pray that he will recover from that. We pray for all the hands that went up. God, uh, their, their faces and, and names of people who are important to us. And thank you that we know that those prayers will be answered according to your will and your way. Uh, Father, we pray for this ministry in Boston. We pray for the Faith Faith Garland ministers. Uh, We pray as they have asked us to uh, for the witnessing opportunities uh, in these moments and for for more teams to come and for safety of those teams. Uh, God, this is a big issue that uh, gets pushed to the side. But human trafficking is something that uh, is is obviously uh, grievously sinful. And we pray, Father, that uh, you'll, you'll bring light into this darkness. Now, God, as we go to your, um, your word here in a minute, we pray that you'll transform us, as, as your word says, by the changing and renewing of our minds. Uh, and God, prepare us for that with the worship team. Thank you for their gifts and their talents. And now, uh, God, enable us to offer up our songs as, as offerings of praise to you. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to revisit what Kenny said real quick. For those that are online watching, he told us that his esophageal surgery was a success and that yesterday he was able to eat regular food, solid foods. Kenny, how long has it been since you've been able to do that? Four weeks. He hasn't been able to eat regular food. Go ahead. What? It's been months since he's been able to eat regular food, and that surgery was a success. Let's give the Lord a hand, y'all. That's incredible. That is great news. Praise God. You know, this is praise and worship, and I'm telling you right now, I'm giving you permission to sing out loud. You can sing as loud as you want. Kenny will. I promise. If you sit around him, you know that. If you sit over there, you know that. Sing out loud. You can yell amen. You can praise the Lord. You know, if we were at a ball game, I guarantee you would. Missy Kester would be back here with a cowbell. (laughs) Let's praise the Lord, you all. Let's stand as we sing this morning.
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nation. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Oh, I surrender, Lord. Say. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're seeing. Of the risen King, oh Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. What a joy for my soul like the sea. Jesus came into 
Good morning. It's good to see you. I'm Pastor David. If I don't know you, welcome. Good to good to have you here. 
Uh, today we're continuing in our, our study of Matthew's gospel, as we've discussed. Uh, the four gospels are kind of biographical about the life of Jesus. Matthew, as, as well as the other, four, or other three authors, has identified Jesus. Again, Matthew, if you don't know that, Matthew's written to a Jewish audience, and so there's a lot of Jewish themes. We're going to get some more today. Um, but Matthew made sure that we understand in the beginning of his gospel, Jesus is the Messiah. All right? He is the promised one who, who is coming, and that is, that's Jesus very clearly. So we're identified who he is. Uh, we're identifying why he came. Matthew discussed the fact that Jesus' main ministry was a preaching ministry. He came to correct the theology of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, he, he would say, you've heard it said, or, or they say, now I say. Right? He's correcting a lot of theology in his teaching. But ultimately, his greatest message was simple. It's a one-sentence uh, one sentence message. Repent and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Jesus commanded repentance, turning from your sins, turning to God, believing the gospel, and, and then you'll be saved. And, and so he performed miracles to support or authenticate his teaching ministry. And as you're going to see today, a lot of times he would teach a subject, and then he would perform a miracle to back that up. So what did we talk about last week? We finished up with Jesus saying, I came not to be served, but to serve. And now along this road from Jericho to Jerusalem, he is going to serve and give us an example. Okay? So that's the big picture. Now, the last few messages that can, have been a little tough. I don't apologize for tough messages. Uh, you have 30 minutes to absorb them. We have all week. And so it's, it's, it's a shared uh, pain sometimes there when they're difficult. But today's message is different. Today's message is very encouraging. Uh, it deals with a major question about God, about Christianity. Many of you have heard it from your lost friends or unsafe friends and family. Maybe you've asked it yourself, and here it is. If God is so good, this is one of the big questions. If God is so good, then why is there so much human suffering? Right? If God is so good, why is there so much human suffering? If it's true, and we know it is, that God created all people in His image and that he loves everybody, why is there sickness? Why is there disease? Why is there death? We've all been touched one way or another by these effects. Why is there human suffering? Well, as we are going to discuss today, the opinion in the first century is actually correct. Human suffering is ultimately the result of sin. All right, It's ultimately the result of sin. Some things we can connect directly. Uh, some may suffer the consequence of lung cancer because they chose to smoke all their life. All right? Some may suffer lip and gum cancer because they chewed tobacco all their life. Some may suffer with the incurable disease that they got because they were sexually immoral. Uh, some may suffer with physical disabilities as a result of an accident uh, that they were intoxicated in. Right? Sometimes you can correlate it directly, but we've got to be really, really careful not to be judgmental. Because all sickness, all, all health issues, everything that we talk about in life, all human suffering has one simple answer. It's, we're sinful people. And the wages of sin is what? Death, okay? All right, the wages of sin is death. So I, since we have the answer to that question, I think we ought to change the question. Since we already know why there's so much human suffering, it's because sin in the world. What, what's a better question? Okay, here, I wrote a better question. If human suffering is inevitable, and as we just discussed, it is, because we are sinful people, as we just discussed, we are, then what is the solution? All right? Ask a better question. What is the solution to human suffering? Instead of laboring over the why, let's discuss how we get through it. And that's going to be what we're going to talk about today. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, if you want to turn there. If not, if you just want to listen, please stand. We're going to, we're going to read verses 29 through 34, ending up at the end of the 20th chapter. Again, my mistake last week, I misspoke. We will continue with Matthew 21 next week because that is a triumphal entry. Okay, now we begin at verse 29 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, here we go. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them, for he had compassion for them, and he touched their eyes. Instantly they could see, then they followed him. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you for preserving this miraculous event, this illustration of your teaching. God, this very important subject that we need to understand today about human suffering. Uh, we need to have the compassion of Christ, the eyes of Jesus, and see it and ask where we can help. That's our goal today. Maybe we as Christians will get softer hearts this morning. Maybe there's some who are suffering here today or are going to be encouraged by, by the fact that you touch these men. And they're going to ask that you touch them today. And I pray most importantly that there are unbelievers, just like in that crowd that day, who see the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus, not to just touch the body, but to save the soul. And maybe this will be the day that they surrender to that calling on their life and they become a Christian this morning. That's our ultimate goal. So God, remove me from your word and speak through it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. All right, Jesus, as we've discussed, this is historical. He lived in the northern part of Israel, up by the Sea of Galilee, up on the northern shore, a place called Capernaum. That's where he and his disciples lived. Now they have left that area, and they've left on purpose. They're heading down south uh, to get to Jerusalem by the Passover. That would have been a normal practice for them. Uh, they don't head straight south because that would cause them to go through Samaria, which was unclean, and they would not travel through Samaria. So they would hang, uh, I guess, a left as they were heading south, and they would go east, cross over the Jordan River, travel down south, and they would come back across. Jericho was along that path. Everybody remembers the story about Jericho, right? What happened to Jericho? The walls came tumbling down, right? Joshua marched around Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Well, guess what? They rebuilt Jericho. And Jericho was along the route, the, the normal route, to Jerusalem. It was strategically located. It's 20 miles from Jerusalem. And so it was the last leg of the journey for most people. But it was a 3,000-foot elevation change. So that last leg was a tough one. So a lot of people would camp out there in Jericho. They would get re-energized, get rested, and get ready, because that last leg was a doozy. And so that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples. Now, we haven't heard from the crowd in a while. Jesus has been teaching his disciples. That's been his focus group for the last few messages. Now we see the, the, the crowd starting to join. They're following Jesus. They're, they've heard he's teaching. They've heard, seen these miracles. They're expecting something big. And so now that they're leaving Jericho, he's got a big crowd. He's got his entourage, and they're headed to Jerusalem. Again, they're expecting him to take on the leadership, but they're going to miss some very serious teaching points if they're not paying close attention. Okay? These are the very people, by the way, that you're going to talk about next week. They're the people saying, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of the ancestor David, praise God in highest heaven. And they're not really going to figure that out. And a week later, they're going to start saying what? Crucify him. All right, crucify him, the same people. So we're going to see that coming along the next couple of weeks. For now, let's talk about what happened. And we just, we just uncovered. It's very important for us to see. Let's begin with the, uh, the two guys. They, the disabled made them beggars, or the disability, excuse me, made them beggars. Um, since these two men couldn't see, they couldn't work. And since they couldn't work, they were not able to provide for themselves. Like any other disability in the Jewish culture at that time, that relegated them to being beggars, and they had to beg in order to survive. It was a tough form of welfare. Fortunately for a beggar, God had commanded in his law that the Jews give money to the poor. So like many other disabled individuals at the time, uh, they got up every morning, they got cleaned up, they went down to the street corner, and they begged, and the local Jews would support them. It was a miserable life. Not only did they suffer physically, but they suffered mentally and emotionally because people didn't give out of compassion. They didn't help them out of love. They helped them out of obligation. They said this was never a relationship. This was a handout. All they got was a few coins. All they got was a little bread. All they got was enough to get by. It was a miserable life, all right? They were, they were made beggars. The disability was blamed on sin. I introduced this to you. We're going to talk a little bit more about it now. Um, in the first century Jewish culture, it was believed that disabilities were the result of either the parent's sin or the individual's sin. So being blind was a curse because of sin in their culture, okay? Uh, now, we know that's not only true just from history, but it's also true from the other Gospels. John's Gospel records Jesus is coming upon a blind man, and what happens there? Jesus asks his disciples, or his disciples ask Jesus, excuse me, who sinned? Did he sin or did the parents sin? Okay, so that was a cultural thing. They believed the disabilities came from sin, right? It came from sin. Now, 
It is possible that that's true. We've talked about that already. Jesus didn't deny it, but Jesus had compassion. He had compassion for these men, and we'll go for that here in just a minute. For now, we need to pause and reflect on something. In the opening, I mentioned several cases of suffering that were the direct cause of sin. Uh, There can be no doubt about that. But isn't all suffering caused by sin? Isn't all suffering go all the way back to Adam and his first sin that caused life to be mortal instead of immortal? Every sickness, every disease ultimately is the consequence of sin. So all suffering is that consequence. So now, as a sinner, we have to be careful not to judge each other. That's what's happening in this, this passage, and it happens today. The people tried to keep these sinful men from Jesus. They didn't think that they deserved the rabbi because their sin was so heavy and so dark that they were blind. They really didn't know the rabbi. They really didn't know Jesus. He had been teaching this truth for a while now, that the greatest in the kingdom would be those who lower themselves and minister and serve. They had just heard that message. We talked about it last week. And yet, get this, not one of the disciples reached out to help these guys. Not one of the twelve who had listened to all these messages and all these sermons put it to practice. Not one offered a, a piece of bread. Not one offered a coin. All they said was shut up and leave him alone. Right? That's, that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? To be with Jesus and still not getting the message. Church, we've got to be very careful about this. We have a tendency to judge those who suffer based upon their own personal sins ourselves. We choose who gets mercy. We choose who doesn't get mercy. And we do it based upon our own standards and our own assumptions. And we'll say stuff like, well, they shouldn't have smoked. They deserve it. Well, they shouldn't have messed around. They deserve it. Well, they shouldn't have been drinking. They deserve it. Are some of those things true? Well, yeah. But is it the right way to handle it? No. Right? Absolutely not. The Christ-like answer is never, well, they deserve it. That's never the Jesus answer. What is the Jesus answer? The Jesus answer is, how can I help? And the Jesus answer is, how can I help? It's never, they deserve it. How can I help? It's never, well, what did they do wrong? Well, they did this wrong, they did that wrong, so they deserve what they're going. No, it's, that's never the answer. The answer is always, how can I help? Who in this room has not received mercy? Right? All of us have. So who in this room cannot be givers of mercy? When you stop and think about it. I'll just chew on that for a little bit. Back to the story. These men had likely gone through this routine all their lives. It, it seems by the context that they've been blind since birth. Day after day, they, they called out to travelers for food and for money, but this day was different. This day, somebody new came along. Somebody important came along, and they acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. This, this is the beginning of hope for these men. They acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. All right? Uh, they had asked for thousands of people for handouts, many of them rabbis, Uh, But they knew Jesus was different. When they heard that Jesus was coming, they didn't call him Jesus of Nazareth, which would have been the proper name to call him, Jesus of Nazareth. Everybody else would have called him that. Instead, they call him the son of David. These Jewish men call Jesus the son of David, and that's very important in their culture. In the Old Testament, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be the son of David. So when these blind men acknowledge that Jesus is the son of David, they're saying, we believe he is the one. We have faith that he is the Messiah. They are confessing their faith in Jesus when they, come in, they say he is, he is the son of David and that he is Lord. All right? So he, they believe that he's the Messiah. They cried out for the Messiah. And from the Messiah, they cried out for mercy. They cried out for mercy. The Greek word, here used for cried out means a vehement outcry. It means to scream. It means to shriek. How many of you have had a child that's throwing a fit and they're just screaming at the top of their lungs and they're crying out? You ever heard that? Is, is that a joyful sound? What do you want it to do? Stop. You don't care what it takes. You want it to stop. That's the picture this word is, is giving. The crowd, they wanted it to stop. The disciples, they wanted it to stop. They were shrieking and screaming so loud. That's how passionate they wanted Jesus. That's how desperate they were for Jesus. And what were they asking for so passionately? Mercy. I got to ask the question, who in this room has not received mercy? You know what mercy is, right? Mercy is not receiving what you deserve, right? It's not receiving what, it's going to court and you are guilty and somebody paying your debt for you and declaring you not guilty, Every one of us, if we're believers, have been shown mercy. And that's what these men are crying out for. They're crying out for mercy. 
So there is the solution, really, when you stop and think of it. The solution to human suffering is to cry out to Jesus for mercy. That's the answer. Cry out to Jesus for mercy. He is the agent of creation. He is the all power and all authority. He is the Messiah. Nothing is too hard for him. Cry out to Jesus, right, for mercy. Let's talk about the merciful Savior for a few minutes and see how this played out. Crowds around Jesus, including the disciples, none of them bent down to help these two beggars. Uh, they actually tried to shut them up, but they just got louder and louder and louder and louder until Jesus finally looks at them and asks them that question. All right? What do we hear? We hear that Jesus listens to suffering sinners. All right? Jesus listens to suffering sinners. The blind men crank it up. All right? They turn the volume up. When we read, they got so loud that over the crowd, Jesus hears them. They're successful. Jesus heard the cry of the blind beggars, and he didn't tell them to be quiet, did he? He didn't tell them to shut up, did he? He didn't do that. Instead, he listened. To me, that's so encouraging. We're all sinful people. We all suffer at different ways at different times, and it's a constant cycle in our life. Isn't it good to know that someone's listening? And isn't it good to know that that someone is the creator of the universe? Jesus is always listening. I promise you, we read today, Jesus will never tell you to be quiet. He wants to hear from us. He wants to ask us that ultimate question that shows his compassion. Jesus has compassion for suffering sinners, right? He's got compassion. He doesn't say, go back and sit down. You're sinners. You don't deserve it. Your suffering is the consequence of your sin. Leave me alone. Instead, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? I love to hear that. What do you want to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And that's awesome. Jesus doesn't condemn them, even though their blindness could have even been the consequence of personal sin. We don't know. But Jesus saw their suffering and asked the men how he could help. Again, to me, I find that encouraging. Like these blind men, Jesus has compassion for me. You could say that. He has compassion for me. He cares about me. He cares about you too. Right? Jesus is compassionate for suffering sinners. He really does want us to tell him what we want from him. He wants to hear from us. He wants to listen to us. Right? That's because like those blind men, he has compassion for suffering sinners. And that's why we're here this morning. Now for the greatest thing to think about. Jesus has the power to save. Amen? The power to save suffering sinners. That's only Jesus. Pay close attention to the men's answer. Normally they would have asked for a handout. If anybody passing by, do you have some bread to share? Do you, do you have some food? Do you have some coins? They don't ask that this time. They know this time, this one, this individual can give them more. They know the one that they're talking to now is not offering a temporary relief. Right? They're, they're not just going to get bread for the day. They know from Jesus that they can get life and they can actually see. They know Jesus by faith. Right? And because of their faith, Jesus actually touched them. Can you imagine being touched by Jesus? Hey, can you picture him reaching out and putting a hand on you? Wouldn't that be awesome? Right? That would be so amazing. He did that because of their faith. And you say, wait a minute. It only said that they were healed. Yes, they were healed. They could physically see. But that was a temporary fix, if you stop and think about it. They were only going to see for a little while. There would be a day that they closed their eyes and never saw again in this body. It would be cruel if that's the best that Jesus could do. It would be temporary healing. Think this through with me. We ask Jesus for a miracle to help our loved one or help ourselves from human suffering. He can, and sometimes he will answer those prayers, just like in the story this morning. But if a miracle actually occurs, it doesn't mean there's not going to be more human suffering, does it? I stopped and thought about it. My dad was a, he was a man who struggled with heart disease really badly. His first heart attack when he was 30, he had eight, eight heart casts. I don't know how many stents were in those eight heart casts. He had open heart surgery at 45, open heart surgery at 59, Right? And I was there for his last heart cath. And when the doc said, I can't do anything else for you. Heart was working about 27%. We just thought he was going to just drop dead. He kept going. You know what? The heart didn't kill him. Cancer did. So you stop and think about it. A person miraculously healed of, say, cancer could still suffer with heart disease and die of a heart attack. A person miraculously healed of blank, you fill in the blank, may still suffer from blank and die. Right? 
These miraculous healings were temporary. What is permanent? The gift of eternal life. The gift of salvation. The opening of the spiritual eyes is what the true miracle is. And that's what happened with these men. You've got to understand, when we get to the end of this, typically when Jesus would heal somebody, he would tell them, oh, go, don't tell anybody, just go home. Or sometimes he would say, go to the priest and, and pay uh, you know, the, the offering for someone who's cured of leprosy, for example. He would always send them. What's different about these guys? They followed him, right? And that word that's used to translate to English, they followed him, is they followed him forever. They always followed him. They followed him perpetually, which means they got saved. And, and in Mark's gospel, Mark, uh, they believe that Mark can identify Bartimaeus because he stayed with the disciples because he was saved and he helped start the early church. So the greatest thing wasn't the gift of physical sight. The greatest thing was the fact that they followed Jesus because of their faith in him as the son of David, the Messiah. Right? And they got the greatest thing they could receive, the hope of eternal life. What a beautiful illustration of one of the most important truths in our universe. Jesus cares about human suffering. Right? Jesus cares about human suffering. I, I read a quote from Charles Swindoll in his commentary on this passage. I, I just, it was profound. He said, some people serve others because they get paid to do it. That's true. Others serve, score, others serve to score points with people around him. That's true. Others serve to fulfill some vow, social obligation, or religious requirement. That's true. Jesus, however, served because he was moved with compassion. His deep love fueled his desire for service. Jesus loves us. He doesn't act out of obligation. He doesn't act because he has to. He acts out of compassion for human suffering. So yes, all suffering is the consequence of sin, but Jesus is the one who has paid for those sins. He's the only one who can offer the solution to all human suffering. And here it is. Here's the solution to human suffering. The only true solution to human suffering is eternal life. Right? It's eternal life. What does that take? We learn it from the beggars. It takes identifying Jesus, professing Jesus with our mouth, believing in our heart, right, that God raised him from the dead and will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. Right, it's the very same thing that they did. They identified Jesus, they cried out to Jesus, and they were saved. So, I've given you the what, now the so what. As I mentioned in the beginning, there's so much human suffering in our world today. Some of you are experiencing it now, uh, either firsthand or secondhand, and you've probably asked, why would God allow this in my life? We've heard the truth today. God takes no pleasure in human suffering, but Jesus cares about human suffering. Out of his great love for us, he provided the ultimate solution. And the Apostle Paul shared this with us, and he is a man who suffered greatly. And this is one of my, my comfort passages, my hope passages, when, when I'm struggling with suffering. And here it is, Philippians 3, 21. It's a great passage to memorize. He, Jesus, will do what? He'll take our mortal bodies, and he'll change them into glorious bodies like his own. Is anybody looking forward to that? All right, any, anybody getting tired of this mortal body? Some of you aren't old enough for that yet. Some of you are still enjoying and think you're immortal, but you're not. This body gets old, this body gets achy, this body gets sick, this body is going to die. But if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you have the hope that these two men had, and you're following Jesus, when the end of your path on this earth comes, you will be rewarded. You will never suffer again. Human suffering on this, this earth for a believer is temporary, right? It stops when we, our heart stops beating and our lungs stop breathing. And we're given that eternal gift of life. We'll never grow old, we'll never get sick, and we'll never die. Thank the Lord for that hope. That is the hope for all human suffering. Now, there is another body that I have to speak of. We'll all have glorified bodies, thankfully. But there's the body that Jesus says, for eternity will take the maggots that will never die and the fire that will never go out. And that's morbid. It's Mark 9 to 48 if you want that. There is misery after life for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. There, there is hopelessness. There is lostness. There is permanent pain and anguish for those who say, no, thank you to Jesus. I don't want you. I don't need you. I'm good on my own. I've got this taken care of. I'm just going to die and cease to exist anyway, and they're going to learn the hard way that that's not the case. There is another body. There is another body after death, and it's the one that will experience these things and they will suffer misery for eternity. I pray that that's no one in this room. 
if you are, think of this first takeaway. I've got a couple takeaways to close this out. First one, are you suffering spiritually? Are you suffering spiritually? Figuratively speaking, are you blind? Are you unsaved? We've got to ask that question every Sunday. If we don't, we're failing. Um, if you're unsaved, you're facing eternity in misery. You're not going to recognize your friends. You're hearing, oh, I'm going to party in hell with all my friends. We're going to have a great time. You know, you're not. You're going to be suffering individually. He, he's asking the same question to you today, if that's you. What do you want me to do? Right? Ask for it all. Right? Ask for it all. Your answer should be, save me. Let me see. Open my eyes, Jesus. And he'd do that today. He paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. He gave you the hope of eternal life when he was resurrected from the dead. What more do you need to know? All right? I, try, I, I invite you, come and see one of us before you leave here today. Are you suffering physically? Man, this is encouraging today to me. I hope it is to you. He cares about our suffering. He will touch us. I mean, it may be today. It may be tomorrow, right? Or it may be three or four years down the road. I may have to suffer for 10 years. You may have to suffer for longer. But that is a finite, temporary period of time. Right? It's a finite period, to, and it will change. The suffering will stop, okay? We believe that such with all of our hearts. And if you're struggling with physical suffering and you'd like just someone from the staff or someone from the church to come alongside you and help you walk this path, that's how Jesus touches people through his church. Allow us to do that. Allow us to carry your burdens if you have them today. Finally, and I think this is, the, to me, the most important thing we can understand. Are you showing compassion for those who are suffering? Are you one of those who say, well, you deserve it, or they deserve it? Or are you one who says, how can I help? It's a huge difference, right? A huge difference. And the difference is what Jesus tells us in this passage today is that we need to be people of compassion. He can reach out and touch others through us. Are we able to do that, and are we willing God, thank you for your truth. You've guided us through your truth. Um, your truth saves and your truth sanctifies. And so I pray for the first. I pray for those who are unsaved. I pray that they'll understand this is not about religious practice or cultures or traditions. This is about a personal relationship with the Savior of the universe who loves and cares for them deeply. He gave them one more chance to be in his church today, among his people today, and he gave them one more opportunity to hear the truth today. There is a heaven, there is a hell. There is permanent suffering and there is suffering that stops and never happens again. And the difference is belief in him, in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I pray for those who are unsaved in our room today or maybe watching online, that they will not wait till it's too late to accept Jesus. For those of us who have, there, there is suffering we experience. I pray for the endurance. I pray for treatments and doctors and the, the hands of specialists that can help us. You, you touch through them as well. But God, thank you for the knowledge of knowing that this suffering is temporary. It will stop. And thank you again for that encouragement. And pray, God, that we will be people like Jesus. Those people watched as Jesus was the one who stepped up to, to show the example of service to those who are suffering. May, may we follow in his footsteps. May we be people who say, how can I help? God, thank you for that in advance. We love you. We praise you. Bless your invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. This is your time to respond. Everyone who's lost someone they love long before it was their time. You feel like the days you had were not enough when you said goodbye. And to all of the people with burdens and pain. Keeping you back from your life You believe that there's nothing and There is no one who can make it right 
There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. For the marriage that's struggling, just to hang on They've lost all of their faith and love They've done all they can to make it right again Still it's not enough For the ones who can't break The addictions and chains They try to give up but you come back again Just remember That you're not alone in your shame And your suffering There is hope for the helpless And rest for the weary Love for the broken heart There is grace and forgiveness Mercy and healing, you meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus when you're lonely and it feels like the whole world is falling on you. You just reach out, you just cry. Jesus, cry to Jesus, for the widow who suffers from being alone, wiping the tears from her eyes, and for the children around the world without a home, say a prayer tonight. Just stand, please. Cause there is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. We meet you wherever you are. There is love and investment, rest for the and healing meet you wherever you are cry out to Jesus and cry out to Jesus you can cry out to Jesus oh cry out to Jesus Thank you for being here. I hope you've been encouraged by the Word of God and by His uh, Spirit and blessing among us today and among His people. And so if there's something you'd like to talk about, we'll stick around. We'd be glad to uh, share that with you. Um, but there's several things. Let me just share. Read your bulletin. It is obviously Easter season. So there's extra services, 7, 9, 11 on Easter Sunday. There's Good Friday services and Good Friday communion. So make sure you got all your calendars checked off for those things. There's also blood drive, the exercise class, the new ladies class. Um, there's just several things going on. I can't read them all, but just point your attention to your bulletins. Uh, open gym tonight with volleyball at 6 p.m. We had a good turnout last week. What, 10 people came and played and uh, had five on five, so there's more room. Uh, there's more room. Enjoy uh, getting together without me. I will not be there. Um, like I said, I cannot show up because I cannot play. So, next week, again, correcting myself from last week, we do have, we are at the right place to do the triumphal entry in Gospel of Matthew before we break. I'm looking forward to the break. Um, Ephesians is one of my favorite books of the Bible. 
And it talks about living together in Christ in the church and what's, what's the body look like when it's functioning well, the church body. So we'll do that all through the summer and come up back up with Matthew's Gospel in the fall. So I'm excited about that, looking forward to it. All right, enough encouragement. Stack the chairs, please, five high. If you can, move the stacks to the front or the back with the, the dollies that we have. It's a big help because we've got events that take place in here all week long. So help when you can, and we appreciate it. All right, I just wanted to close a little differently. I've been uh, doing some studies in my own personal studies, and I came across, uh, and I do a lot of benedictions uh, with my Army stuff. I do a lot of invocations and benedictions every time they have a change of command, every time I change responsibility, things like that. I get the chance to, to offer benedictions, and I don't do that in church. I'm like, well, that's just silly. All right, that's just silly because these are awesome. And so I'm going to offer a benediction for us before we leave today. It comes from Hebrews. It comes from Hebrews chapter 13. It's the way the author finished up his text. He says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you, the church, with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. God bless.